This is the Empower Podcast. Release May 2nd, 2023. Episode 630. Renewable Energy Policy with Ari Gersman. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble at Contextual Electronics. I'm Ari Gerstman at the Department of Energy. Hey, my old friend Ari Gerstman. How you doing? I'm doing great, Chris. It's so good to hear from you, and I am so flattered that you've invited me onto the Amp Hour. I want to yeah. congratulate you for a decade plus of a very good podcast. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, so Ari and I know each other from high school, and we took very different career paths, and yet we dovetailed into this thing where... I talk about electronics all the time, and Ari is now at the DOE working on policy and lots of other cool stuff that we're going to talk about here today. Yeah, I, I would say that we're, we're we were both nerds in high school, yeah. and we continue we <laughs> yes, continue nobody, to be nerds. That, just that in very is different, very fair. Just in very different things. Yes, that is very very fair. Yeah, that has not changed. No, not at all. <laughs> no, nobody was like looking at us in high school and thinking like, oh. One of these guys is going to, he's going to be in Hollywood. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Or, or, you know, like a formula one racer. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's talk about, uh, so you're at the DOE now. Yeah. You've been at some other places. I think the, the, the role just prior is also really relevant too. Yeah. It actually might be more interesting to your listeners than my current job, but we could talk about everything. Okay, great. So you're at the DOE now. Let's start there. Let's start with what you're doing right now. Obviously, the DOE is a U.S.-based agency. We have a lot of international listeners. We'll try and explain stuff from uh, you know an international context, but this is going to be some U.S.-based policy stuff. I'm guessing there are very similar things going on in the EU uh, and other parts of the world. There, there are, but I am woefully inadequate <laughs> in talking to them. Yeah. But there are some exciting things going around uh, the world, going on around the world in terms of addressing the climate crisis and doing it in the the particular way that the U.S. has embarked on over the past couple of years that I think could be really insightful for people from all over the world. So I think it's worthwhile to listen, even if you're not an American. Yeah, don't don't hang up yet, folks. Right. <laughs> Give us like five minutes, a couple more dad jokes, and then hang up. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so hang up for a podcast. I don't know. Like tap. Don't tap. Right. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> don't touch that dial. <laughs> the, right. There's the the Churchill line, which is uh, you can always count on America to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. So that 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 feels very apropos. So, um, as many of your listeners are probably aware. There's been some incredibly major legislation around climate action here in the United States over the past two and a half years, um, and, and in particular during the two years when Democrats controlled the White House, the House of Representatives, and the U.S. Senate, which is uh, you know the policymaking trifecta here in Washington. When you control all three, uh, you could do some pretty exciting things. And we just came out of uh, uh, two years of, of pretty busy legislative sessions. Um, as, as many of you know, Congress is uh, not the most effective governing body in history. Uh, terrible. Terrible is the word I believe you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I am, uh, I'm familiar with its uh, popularity ratings. I think you and I were more popular in high school than Congress. Oh, there we go. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, Congress got a lot done in the last Congress. And in particular, uh, there are two bills. There are many bills that came out of uh, the last Congress that are really important. But there are two that that really inspired me to come and join the department. And one is the bipartisan infrastructure law, which passed in uh, 2021. And the other is the Inflation Reduction Act, which passed in 2022. Those two programs together gave the Department of Energy $100 billion <laughs> to, uh, yeah, like a lot of money. A hundred billion dollars to uh, to to lead a, a supply side transition of our energy paradigm, which is a fancy way of saying that Congress is throwing a lot of money at climate change. You know, I think uh, in the past, 
uh, a lot of climate activists would have preferred some sort of carbon tax or cap and trade type paradigm where uh, you know the the money necessary to to lead the green transition uh, would have come out of taxing uh, uh, carbon rich activities. That ethos is kind of out the door now, yeah. and more and more so. It's just you know we're going to make it so financially irresistible to uh, uh-huh. engage in the green transition. <laughs> uh huh. That only an idiot would continue to uh, light stuff on fire. Interesting. So that that's Wait, real quick on the on the yeah. on the the cabin trade thing because there is this like weird quasi market we've mentioned on the show before like this weird like green credits kind of thing that is not regulated not anything but like and there's been like John Oliver pieces on yeah. it and like, oh, and like so what is the visibility of that is like that is that anything is that like anything people should pay attention to from I, your perspective I you know like I I I don't pay attention to it how about okay. that yeah yeah yeah. Because I feel like it's it's like those things where like you you like oh Delta Delta is buying green offset credits and it's like all this BS around that. It's like okay, well you know show me the paper trail I guess, but like nobody you know anyone who's clicking a button for like two extra dollars is it's just like this like thing that goes in your cart basically. You know that that's kind of feels like where the transaction stops. That's right. It, it's really hard to you know to to it's it's really hard to assign attribution right. So the activities that so and so is undertaking are you know beneficial for the climate and you have reserved the benefit of those activities through some sort of transaction right if it's a leaky market or a poorly regulated market it's much more likely that that same person is selling off the the attribution rights of that activity to a lot of people right yeah that's exactly my concern yeah <laughs> yeah and and or the activity that they quote unquote are only doing in order to, uh, you know, give you that climate saving credit is an activity they might have done anyways, right? So right, it's right. it's really, uh, you know, not not something I pay close attention to. Okay. Now there are interesting credit markets uh, around renewable energy, and we could talk about that later in the show. Sure. But yeah, a lot of the economic schemes around buying and trading. Uh, the ability to pump carbon into the atmosphere just aren't successful. Not because they aren't based in uh, sound theory or good economics, but mostly because they're politically unpalatable. Got it. You know, not to go on too much of a tangent, but it's it's not dissimilar from energy efficiency versus renewable energy. And if you're thinking about your house and your house's uh, carbon footprint, it is way more palatable for uh, your average Joe homeowner to uh, throw some solar on their roof, uh, say that the energy that they're consuming is renewable uh, and call it a day, then to, you know, go in and retrofit their house. So add Mm -hmm. more insulation, look for, you know, where where there's Mm -hmm. breakage in the ceiling, um, you know, do all of the fan testing, make sure appliances are, are efficient, et cetera, et cetera. All of that work is extremely uh, disruptive. Whereas, you know, throwing solar on your on your roof, pretty easy. And then after that, you get free electricity, you know, and that and that's just politically a, a much more, uh, you know, a, a, a much easier sell than than energy efficiency. And so I it, I would I would think that a lot of the efforts that the US government is undergoing right now, uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, are similar to that kind of paradigm where we're just going to make it really, really easy to do the right thing and not be too disruptive uh, to your life. And uh, we're going to accomplish that by throwing an incredible amount of money in it. Yeah. And that's what we've talked about here on the show, too, is that like it didn't, you know, we've, we've talked about solar for a long time. Dave, my co-host, he's got solar, but like he lives in Australia where there's like this incentive market that was, again, that same kind of thing where it was, it was stupid not to basically put in solar in that case and right. like okay that makes sense but like but th- at the same time people were trying to push solar in the u.s and it just it didn't make economic sense and like then it becomes only a you know what you believe in versus what makes sense for your pocketbook kind of thing and it does it does feel like this kind of if you want to move the the great masses you just make it non you make it non-political you just make it this this other thing right this other economic decision yeah, and 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 just you know, I mean, most people can divorce politics from balancing their checkbook, 
right? Yeah, right. And if it makes economic sense to do something, they really don't care if it's something that Democrats or Republicans uh, have advanced. They do what's rational, and then they go back to their lives. What's interesting about solar in the United States is that it differs wildly state from state. So where you live in North Carolina, it's not nearly as lucrative yeah. to put solar on <laughs> your know. on your roof as it is here in the District of Columbia. Yeah. Every single state and the district, and I'm not sure about territories. We could talk about territories another time, I guess. But every single state and the district has either a renewable energy portfolio standard or it doesn't. They are also you know, all sorts of systems across the country in different states for solar subsidies, solar tax credits, et cetera. In fact, nationally right now, you might be aware that in the Inflation Reduction Act, the, the tax credit for installing renewable energy uh, is up considerably. And in, and in particular, uh, doing so in an historically neglected neighborhood, mm. part of the Justice 40 initiative gets you an even better tax break. Oh, interesting. You know, it, it really depends where you live and who's doing your taxes and what your tax liability is, right? One of the, one of the, this is a total tangent, but one of the interesting things that happened with solar and, and tax credits is that, you know, if you're a nonprofit, how are you going to take advantage of that tax credit? <laughs> right. So right. the Inflation Reduction Act actually is enabling nonprofits to monetize uh, what would be the tax credit through, you know, some sort of remittance from mm. from the government and that's that's completely unclear to me how that's all going to work i'm out of my depth there that's happening over uh with my colleagues in the department of the treasury huh but those are those are some of the interesting things that that people are figuring out here in washington in the wake of those bills i'm working on a very 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 narrow set of programs so i i mentioned earlier that the department of energy got 100 billion dollars through bil and ira the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, the department's mission fundamentally changed as well, because up until now, it's- The, the entire DOE? Well, I mean, up until now, uh, mm. it's mostly been a nuclear security agency, yep. a science agency, yeah, a research and development, maybe some deployment, uh, I, excuse me, maybe some demonstration agency, you know, that kind of work. Mostly, you know, lower on the technical readiness level curve kind of activities. Uh, and BIO and IRA fundamentally changed it into a deployment agency. I always kind of assumed that there was like a grid aspect in there too. Is that is that a bad assumption? So a lot of the activities that DOE does around the grid are, um, you know, to incentivize new technologies that can be deployed uh, to make the grid, uh, you know, more efficient, more reliable more available, you know, require fewer upgrades, et cetera, et cetera. But not like hand, not like hands on. Yeah. There's no centralized control. I, I didn't know that piece. I mean, like, it's not like right. centrally owned, centrally managed or anything like that. No, it's, it's not like Europe it's where- a living organism. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, and it's owned by a lot of different players. Right. Yep. And so we could talk about the grid at length if you want. But well, I I am a kind of an expert. I did read one book on it, so <laughs> <laughs> I forget what it's called. I should have have the book up uh, on my my screen here. But uh, yeah, I did read that one book, and it's a fascinating and wonderful book. But uh, yeah, we'll yeah, no, the grid's incredible. Definitely a feat of engineering, and also in bad need of up upgrade. Yeah, right. like of, of seriously seriously needing upgrade and in a lot of different important ways and all of those ways have intense policy ramifications and so mm. that's that's the area that really piques my interest gretchen baki or i'm not sure <laughs> if i'm saying her name right that's the that's the book i'm talking about and if i'm looking at it right on my computer it's 2.99 on kindle right now there so you go check what it a out deal. folks yeah that yeah. is a good deal so yeah actually in in my last job i dealt more with grid type work because in that job, I was I was advocating uh, on behalf of the District of Columbia uh, in front of our Public Service Commission, which is our utility regulatory body, for specific outcomes and policies and the way that they regulate utilities that were you know better for the climate and better for um, people with less means. So mm -hmm. you know we could talk at length about the grid, but my my job now it's it's running basically it's it's running capacity building. Uh, one thing that I recognized working in D.C. government is that state and local governments are critical 
in uh, tackling a lot of different energy problems. And in particular, you know, enabling a lot of these consumer side um, uh, and small government side upgrades and, and transitions. And so I work in the new Office of State and Community Energy Programs here in DOE. In that organization, I work on the state energy program. So BIL, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, gave $500 million to state energy program. Wow. And $250 million for the states to set up an energy efficiency revolving loan fund. There's also a, a number of other programs that state energy offices have to run uh, from grid resilience to energy efficiency conser- conservation block grants. And then also the rebate programs for low income. There's the whole homes rebate program, which uh, enables homes to you know do whatever it can to, they can to uh, to lower their energy consumption, and they'll get they'll get you know money back basically from the U.S. government via state governments. And then there's also one for electrification, so another rebate program focused on getting people heat pumps, hot water heat pumps, and and those kinds of activities. So those kinds of appliances. So there's you know the state energy offices are are really at the nexus of deploying a lot of the the big consumer side programs uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure law and the uh, Infl- inflation reduction act that's pretty cool yeah. yeah I mean like what and so that sounds like boots on the ground like especially like the administration of funds stuff like that I mean how how do you see how do you see this stuff actually playing out in the longer term do you expect that it's it's going to be more solar installation it is going to be more this kind of like house to house style battling you know air leaks and insulation type stuff i mean like where do, where do you actually see the biggest i guess what do you think the the likely outcome is and where do you think the actual biggest uh the biggest impact would be uh from an actual energy perspective the biggest impact i think from an energy perspective is the new electric load that the united states is about to acquire oh <laughs> tell me <laughs> i don't know anything about this yeah i mean we're we're pooping out evs like like bananas, right? And it's it's incredible the amount of work that's gone into creating a domestic supply chain for electric vehicles here in the United States. You know, people are already talking about the battery belt in uh-huh. uh, in in uh, across the the southeast. You know, Tennessee is is uh, yeah. has always We're been supposed to get a new plant here. I think. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Tennessee's yeah. always been fabulous in advanced manufacturing, particularly mm-hmm. in uh, automotive, and they're they're doing a lot to to look uh, towards uh, vehicle electrification. So there's there's the manufacturing, which is in and of itself going to be an enormous you know new source of load. But even bigger than that is all of the EVs on the road, right? So I drive an EV. You know, it's an 84 kilowatt hour battery which is huge if yeah. if you stop and think about it in in comparison to things like my house gosh i don't know how many kilowatt hours i use a month probably a couple hundred right and i live in a city so uh you know if if you were commuting 30 40 miles a day uh you could do the math uh if you're if you're doing if you're driving in you used to drive an internal combustion engine and now you're driving an electric vehicle. Uh, you know, you're, you're probably adding 300 kilowatt hours of load to the grid every month. You know, you aggregate that across the gosh, I don't know how many cars there are in America. Uh, you know, at least a hundred million probably. Uh, and, yeah, and one in three people, that sounds about right. I mean, yeah. Right. Sure, so sure. you're talking about just an enormous, enormous new demand for electricity. Right. Wait, so you're saying this is a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> it's it sounded good, but also it kind of sounds bad. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 what I would say it's a it's a good thing because okay. you know, we gotta we gotta get rid of fossil fuels, right? Like we're done we gotta sure. be done with fossil fuels, right? So, well, I mean I guess it depends on your talking to though. Like, yeah, so if you're talking to someone who's like got asthma, uh yeah, getting more ice ice cars internal congestion combustion engine cars off the road, that's good. Uh, or, you know, people that care about climate change also, right? right? But if you're talking to a power provider who's like, uh, how much more power on the lines? You know, like... Oh, well, I assure you, they're salivating. They're they're thrilled yeah. for, for people to, to want to buy their product more. Interesting. The, okay. the really big question, though, 
is that, you know, the power providers, as you put them, most of them in America are investor owned utilities. So they are bottom line driven. Uh, and, you know, they are uh, focused on, on, for the most part, one thing and one thing only, which is returning value to shareholders. Yep. You know, that's their job. And in America, because those investor owned utilities are natural monopolies, i.e., it makes zero sense to have electric distribution competition. That just sounds like an enormous mess. So because they're natural monopolies, they have to be regulated by a public utility commission. That regulation happens at the state level. And as you can imagine, across the country, some states are pretty good at regulating their utilities. Other states do whatever the utilities want them to do. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You know, which, you know, every every state's got its own you know, political needs and, you know, decisions to make. So I'm not going to pass judgment one way or the other, but... Um, oh, I will. Uh, Duke Duke Energy is a hot pile of crap. Uh, <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> am I allowed to say that as a North Carolinian? Uh, I, I think I am. You're definitely allowed to say that. I, I would just, <laughs> uh, uh, as much as I would say is that I have heard this, other people say that about Duke <laughs> Energy before. Yeah, I I don't have opinions on the subject because I no am worries. you know I'm just a simple a civil servant. Public ser- so yeah, yeah. Civil, ser- civil servant. Yep. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, but <laughs> you know let's 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 imagine that there's a state out there. Let's make up a state. There you go. So right, the 52nd state of mm, Electrifica. There you go. And they have a public utility commission, and their local power company is called. You, you come up with that one. Right? Oh, I have to. Yeah, Utopia. Okay. Okay. Yep. Sure. So, like, let's say, so first of all, let's say Utopia is an investor owned utility, right? So, Utopia is like, let's say it's traded on Wall Street. Okay. And, uh, you know, Utopia has been delivering dependably very good dividends to shareholders for decades, right? Yep. Yeah. Really stable stock. So, it's all like, it's like a blue chip, right? So, it's exactly. Uh, yeah. Institutional money. They, yeah. they have very strong demands on the board. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Calpers loves their Utopia holdings, right? Like they know exactly <laughs> what they're going to get. Yeah. Which is fine, right? And but so now the state is adding you know, electrifica is like we're going to electrify everything. Okay? We're just done with fossil fuels. Let's say that and and in particular they are done with gasoline and let's say they're done with natural gas, methane gas, right? And so coal, coal as well. <laughs> well, it really depends. I mean, coal's a whole yeah. other story because it depends sure. where they're getting their power from. Sure, yeah, right. I guess like I, some is, is Electrifica you know, landlocked, or are they? Uh, yeah, right. Okay. Or, right. or you know, is Electrifica uh, a net importer or a net exporter of sure. electricity? Right. 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 If it's a if it's a net exporter of electricity, then Electrifica is very focused on what you know what they use to to create electricity, mm-hmm. and they might be you know, really, really focused on that. If they're a net importer, they might be thinking more about, you know, how do we, you know, defray our exposure to, uh, you know, shocks in the energy systems that mm-hmm. could come from outside our state's boundaries, right? Sure. Okay, sure. So, but regardless, let's say, so Electrifica is like, we're going to electrify everything and we're going to get rid of natural gas, methane gas that's piped into people's homes and we're going to get rid of gasoline. Right. So everybody in the state has to uh, switch over to an electric heat pump, uh, an electric stove and an electric hot water heater. Right. Get rid of the uh, the natural gas in their house. Some some people actually have natural gas powered dryers, which yep, is my just friend wild. Does. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Some people have natural gas powered refrigerators, which is also wild. Oh, yeah. I've, yeah. I've heard about that's also on boats, I think. Or they, the propane ones on boats. I right. Think. Right. Yeah. So there, I mean, like, you know, so Electrifica is like, we're ripping all of that out and we're giving mm-hmm. everybody brand spanking new electric equipment. Right. Yeah. So in Electrifica, if the state did this, and we're just talking about residents right now, we're not even talking about businesses. Yeah. But if the states did this, their electric dem- and they only did this, their uh, electric demand would probably around double. Wow. Okay. Right. So. Yeah. We're talking about an exceptional amount of load. Now, Utopia can look at this in one of several ways. One way it could be, all right, we're going to meet all of this load with distributed energy resources. 
And so what that means is microgrids and solar everywhere. We're not going to overbuild the grid. We're going to solve the load problem at the source, right? So we're going sure. to get everybody it, to put uh, solar on their house here. And, you know, maybe if electri- Electrifica is, is really far north, and so it has, you know, wild swings in electric production from its solar, they might do a battery incentive also. Sure. So, right, there's all kinds of cool opportunities. Also, you could deploy microgrids so that if, you know, if load can't meet generation capacity of your solar panels at this exact moment, you can share load from one of your neighbors, right? Like that would be the the opportunity of, of a multi-customer microgrid uh, where basically something sits sort of behind, but also sort of in parallel with the distribution system. Okay. So Utopia could say, look, we're, we're going to roll out DER and that's going to solve the problem. We're not going to, you know, if we're really, if we do a really, really good job of deploying uh, solar to meet this, that'll solve the problem. They're, they're probably wrong. It probably won't solve the problem. What will also be needed is some kind of energy efficiency measures. And that might mean updating appliances. It might mean, you know, weatherizing homes. It might mean doing a lot to uh, imp- do deep energy retrofits of homes. Uh, it might mean, you know, redoing all of the streetlights so that the streetlights are, sure, you know, yeah. high efficiency LED instead of whatever incandescent bulbs they still got going, right? So this all sounds like really expensive on the Utopia, the company's perspective. Though. It depends. I mean, well, first of all, for an investor-owned utility, nothing's expensive on Utopia because they would rate base all of this. You mean they would just get it back over time? They would get it. They would charge. They would charge the rate payers for it. Oh, interesting. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and the utility commission would decide whether or not their rate payers should be paying for it. There might be other progressive schemes in the in in the legislature where, you know, there is a renewable energy portfolio standard. And that might be an opportunity for um, solar to to take advantage of market forces to proliferate, right? Um, at the end of the day, though, suppliers pay for renewable energy portfolio standards, and they pass that on to customers. So at the end of the day, however you're going to roll out solar, usually it's electricity customers that are paying for it. Rolling out solar or rolling out, you said rolling out solar, do you mean rolling out these changes like this, these general microgrid type of- Regardless. Okay. Okay. Any, any anything the grid or anything the power company does, they're they're passing that along to you. Is that kind of the idea? <laughs> Pretty much, or they're passing yeah. it along to the federal government by taking okay. advantage of some sure. of these amazing programs that we're running at the Department of Energy uh-huh. to enable the utopias of the world, mm-hmm. you know, to avoid charging their their ratepayers for uh, yeah. for for these upgrades, right? Right, but that's still getting paid by somebody. <laughs> right. Well, as, as in so much as taxes go. Yeah. Right. Or, or your kids. Sure. We could talk about, we could talk about, you know, uh, monetary theory all you want, whenever, no. whenever you want. <laughs> Different podcast, man. Different okay. podcast. All right. Good. <laughs> so another way that Utopia might meet the new load is by rolling out energy efficiency and demand response programs. Okay. So basically, uh, you know, if if load is ever getting too bad in Electrifica, your utility Utopia could send texts to everybody in Electrifica saying, "Hey, change your thermostat one way up or one way down," you know, so that we can manage the load, right? Yeah, this is the thing I never understood about that. People don't respond to things. Yeah, they they people are also they're they're funny in responding to small incentives, right? Like the, okay. the number of people who will bend down to pick up a dime, even uh, though like that really isn't worth the time that it took or the activity it took to pick up the dime, right? Yeah. But do you actually mean it would be text messages or would it be like, I've already opted in and Utopia, the, the power company, it just has remote control and it can they change can just, within some threshold. Yes. Like smart so grid that's, style thing. That would be ideal, right? So okay, you, have right. A, you have a nest... And that nest is hooked up to the Wi-Fi and Utopia knows where my nest is. And Utopia knows if my, you know, feeder on the grid is reaching peak load, Uh you know, they can, they can automatically turn my thermostat down 
and you know that that obviously saves me money in consumption they might also give me some sort of rebate or you know some sort of incentive to uh, to enroll in the program in the first place yeah my concern about all this is it's like it's this uh exper- you know like experimental in a certain way right i mean like it hasn't it they've tried it in small scale but like it's never been tried large wide scale before and it's like if they get everything rolled out and all this smart grid stuff and then people are like yeah don't touch my thermostat please yeah so there <laughs> is there's there's one classic example of where mm-hmm. demand response is actually working rather well okay great it's in new york it's run by nicerta the new york state energy research and development agency and it's the brooklyn queens demand management project bqdm uh, there was a neighborhood uh, that kind of straddled Brooklyn and Queens that was getting really weird peak demand uh, signals, mm-hmm. and they set up a demand response program to uh, to level out those signals, and it worked, uh, and it was a lot cheaper than building a new substation. So that's the last thing that Utopia could do, is that they could just say, "Look, we're gonna we're gonna meet just all of this new up. load. Yeah, we're <laughs> just gonna." Build a hundred substations, you know, and that's yeah. gonna and that's gonna solve the problem. Uh, of course, that's more expensive than deploying the DER. Not to mention the fact that that a substation doesn't get you anything once it's created, uh, as opposed to a solar panel, which continues to produce solar energy. What would just a sub, so just building a substation, not like a, a generation plant? Is that what do you mean by the just the substation? So yeah, so that might be at the distribution level. Mm-hmm. So a substation will enable the electric distribution company to manage to to manage load with more flexibility. So they could basically uh, they could okay. the the peak load that the entire system can handle before you know you get rolling brownouts uh, goes mm-hmm. up with each substation you create. I see. Okay. So the you're just saying because it's basically like a it's like a valve that you're installing in a piping system, basically in this case. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And so maybe you would be able to bring in more pipes into the system uh, because you've built more valves. And then the on the Brooklyn Queens program, that was just the, the text message thing? Uh, yeah, I don't know if they're doing it by text message. I think it might have just been enrollment hmm. and automatic. Oh, like and then remote control. Yeah. 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 Okay. An IoT solution. I'm not entirely sure what uh, Siemens did the whole thing. Okay. Well, that must have been cheap. yeah i don't really know i don't know if ari's allowed to say any of these things i'm going to say all the thoughts that i think are in ari's head right now but uh Uh, uh, yeah having having formerly competed with siemens and uh, in another very expensive electrical distribution and power generation company uh abb nothing is cheap in this space that's what's crazy about it to me is that like everything is just so friggin expensive it's crazy Right. And, but just remember that like running that demand management program as expensive as it might have been is sure. so yeah. much cheaper than buying yeah. the land to build a new substation. Because yeah, a distribution right, right. substation, I mean, forget the amount of engineering and work that has to go into building the substation. Right. Right. Like if you're in Brooklyn and Queens, like this is, we're talking half a city block, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's, yeah. Ex- <laughs> that's right. Really that's expensive real estate. Really expensive real estate, right? So that, I mean, and that's, forgetting all of the construction and you know the and all the nimbies that would be at the the meeting saying no you can't build that here right exactly (laughs) or and and all of the metal that needs to go into the i mean just like the sheer amount of metals that need to go into these substations is just unfathomable yeah that's nuts and and obviously you know each each metal has to meet certain purity standards and there's a lot of different kinds of metals and some of those metals are very very expensive and you know Hmm. So it, it, yeah, it's it's always going to be cheaper than building a new substation. New substation is extremely expensive. But okay, here's what's really really funny about utility regulation. Okay, so you know at the at, at the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned you know oh all these costs are going to be borne by Utopia. That sounds really expensive for Utopia. And I said no no no, they'll rate base the whole thing, right? Right. Now utility company makes its profit margin off of how much it successfully rate bases. Okay. So what they want to do is choose the most expensive option because ah. that way their profit is greater. Because they it's, get like some fraction of the of exa- the overall change exa- that's happened. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. So they want the most expensive option. 
they're going to roll out. This is why Siemens is charging so much because they're incentivized to do so. Right. Sorry, I'll stop. Well, <laughs> no, well, Siemens isn't the electric distribution I know, company. I know. I'm just saying, Siemens is the vendor. But if you're vendor. like a subcontractor to a subcon, you know, like you yeah, look if, at all that if, stuff, it yes. just adds up, right? Yeah, yeah. I know. I mean, I would love to be in a business where my customer is incentivized to spend more money. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yes. I think that that is the the right thing there. Right. And so the the role of the public utility commission is to identify the situations where the utility is saying we need to do this really expensive thing because it really is something that needs to happen versus this is just their incentives getting in the way and they're suggesting right. the most expensive thing when, mm. you know, and because all of these things are rate based, you know, it, it means that, you know, when it, every time you buy a kilowatt hour of electricity, you're paying for whatever that new program is. And as you can imagine, uh, a kilowatt hour of electricity is most expensive for an individual resident as opposed to everybody else in the state, right? Like if you're right, a major right. business, you're- Your furnace, you're, 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 getting, right. you're getting pretty good rates. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You're you're negotiating something really good with the utility yeah. company because you'll you'll- you know, or to technically the supplier, it depends whether or not your yeah. supply is deregulated. And we could talk right. all about Co-op power markets and, and yeah, yeah RTOs, like good times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically costs are disproportionately paid for by residents. And, you know, this isn't the same as the tax system where like the wealthier you are, the more you end up paying for the system. This is flat. Right. right. Yeah, a kilowatt right. hour costs a kilowatt hour, no matter if you're dirt poor or the richest man on earth, which okay. is just like if you take a step back and think about how important the electric distribution system is to a community, it's ridiculous that it's also that it's not a progressive system, right? That everybody has to pay their own way at the same rate. But regardless, mm-hmm. the Public Utility Commission is supposed to consider you know, what, what the impact is going to be on ratepayers every time that the utility proposes something. Unfortunately, in America, a lot of public utility commissioners are not sufficiently educated to know the difference between whether or not this is something that's really essential, or if it's just, you know, the utility is falling victim to their incentives. And again, like utilities aren't bad people. They're just behaving rationally, right? Like you want (laughs) to, right? Like this is, this is when you're in a private business and your responsibility is to return value to shareholders. It's, you know, it would be immoral to pass up opportunities to do so. So, you know. Yeah, it's kind of their it, job, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah, I so it, like, yeah. I, I don't fault an IOU for uh, proposing the most expensive solutions, but I do fault a PUC for not being sufficiently uh, aware of uh, alternatives and PUC is a uh, public utility public commission. utility commission. There's a sorry. lot of acronyms here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, hey, okay. man, I listened to some of your podcasts and you got a lot of <laughs> acronyms going over there too. <laughs> yeah, and jargon, jargon generally. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. I, so I have a question generally yeah. about this stuff. So, so one of the things that was in that again, I'm working off one book here, which is stupid and uh, irresponsible no, me. I mean, yeah. but one thing that they put forward that kind of put some fire under my bum was just talking about like the the changing load capabilities as more and more people dump solar onto the the grid. And I'm wondering about your insight into that of like, okay, so now we do, you know, you're talking about like the load and, and the loading capabilities of all this stuff. But now if you do have a community that is incentivizing lots and lots of solar and you're starting to see that dumped onto the grid in daylight hours, yep. and you don't have anything to accept that, that source, right? You don't need to sink for that source. Like, how is that all going to be worked out in this, you know, this kind of this new vision of of what the grid looks like and all of the yeah, the that's a great legislation question. that's happening? So there's three answers to that question. One is the utility can curtail it. So basically, yeah, that one sucks. I really don't one, want that. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah, me neither. Yeah. yeah, that's like basically saying that's like in Maui. I think they said they they're not doing hookups anymore, right? Right. Because like right. the sun's always shining there, and it yep they they're they're like nope, we can't take it. Uh, another option is batteries. Which are exceptionally expensive, right? I know that's what I'm. That's what I looked at, and I'm like, nope, I don't yeah. have 18 grand to spend on like a thing that will power my house for like four hours. Like, no, <laughs> right? Or, or you build more infrastructure to enable that supply to to find load elsewhere. Uh, okay, I mean, which is also not ideal. Not ideal. This right. The solution that I love is and is microgrids 
And so let's talk a little bit about what a microgrid is. So a microgrid can be single customer or multi-customer. Most of the times you think about it, it's multi-customer. And that's what's really exciting. It's also the one that utilities and utility commissions hate the most. And we could talk about why they hate that later. It's kind of like savings and loan where it's like, your electricity is not in your house. Your your power's going over there. It lives in Bill's house. Right. Yeah. Well, there's some of that. There there's definitely some of that. But but you know, in theory, let's let's say let's say one area of the grid has too much generation at, you know, noon, right? During yep. during peak solar. Yep. And so the utility is faced with curtailment, building more capacity to so basically another substation just going in the opposite direction or batteries, right? A fourth option is that let's say that feeder uh, serves, you know, 12 to 15 square blocks and those 12 to 15 square blocks just doesn't have the load to accept that generation. But across the street from one of them, it does. There's an arc furnace in the in the neighborhood just across the way. Let's just say that. <laughs> or let's say it's, you know, let's say it's a, a basketball arena. Okay. Right? Like like something that requires just an enormous amount of electricity all the time. Or a convention center or sure. okay. That's a, a great hotel. Example. Yeah, let's you know? go with convention center. I like that. Okay. Yeah. And convention centers have, have just massive heating and cooling systems, uh, you yeah. know, enormous number of lights lots of elevators right like plenty of load Mm -hmm. so you could build a system that basically enables that convention center to receive supply from across the street off a different feeder during that window through a microgrid and that microgrid is basically a line that's jammed into the boxes of the two buildings from across the street from each other. <laughs> Sounds crude. It is crude. But like, at the end of the day, well, what, what we it did allows... is we, we had two things and we needed to wire them together. So we put a wire between them. <laughs> well, and but like you have to appreciate that a, that's a lot easier said than done when, of course, you're, yeah. when you're looking at two buildings on different feeders. Yeah. And a distribution system. B, there's a whole lot of regulation that's needed to talk about how that convention center compensates the building across the street for the electricity it's purchasing and mm-hmm. what, you know, what levels of, you know, guarantees the convention center gets in terms of uh, the electricity it's buying. The convention center might strong arm the building across the street and be like, look, your solar's going to get turned off. If right. we don't build right. this, better thing, give me a better rate. You're yeah. gonna you're gonna sell this to me for pennies on the dollar, right? Because right. that's better to you than nothing. And also because a lot of the incentive systems, they don't really care about the electricity generation. They care about that the system is turned on at all, so that they can generate the credits. Interesting. So, so like, let me just put, let's try and paint this picture then, because I, I'm a little confused here about when you're saying like across the street. So, like, okay, so we're block A. So we're back in Electrifica and. Utopia, the power company, is serving block A and block B. And block A has a bunch of solar for some reason, and block B doesn't, but it's got this convention center. And you're saying that the only way that power would tra- transfer from block A to block B normally is it would be pushed back onto the grid, onto, you know, from these solar panels onto the grid of block A. It would then have to go back to the substation and go upstream somehow. Correct. But that is not what they want to do. And then have to go back down to block B because it's like at that substation. So then you're saying we're basically crosswiring from block A to block B. You got it. Okay. And when you think about like the the power company and how they know that they're delivering power, like the distribution and the power company and how everybody gets paid now, that is a known kind of function, right? Because yeah. customers on block A, they have their little, they have the dials in their house and it goes up when they're using power and it goes down when they're generating power. But yep. now you're saying that because block A would be generating power and their little meter would be going down and it would be going across to block B and their meter would be going up, there'd be no way to know that it would still, but it would look like to to the power company that the power was coming from them somehow, right? Because they don't, they don't know in transit. Exactly. 
So this is why you need advanced inverters. Okay. Uh, uh, at the at the hookup for a microgrid, so okay. that the microgrid can be informing, in theory, a third party operator, mm -hmm. who then shares that data on a need to know basis right. with the utility. So it's like a toll road to cut across. It's right? actually a toll road is a really good example. But imagine that instead of the rest of the roads being publicly owned, they're privately owned yeah. by an investor-owned road company. Uh -huh. And what you're saying is like, ah, actually, no, I want to start my own little road company over here. <laughs> right. I'm right. not. I'm not actually going to pretend that I'm going to meet the transportation needs of the entire city. Right. But I found that there's a business case to create this one road from point A to point B, and I'm going to do that outside of the investor-owned road building company's yeah. domain, right? So See, now, it's, this is really interesting because the microgrid, that term, I always assumed I knew what it meant. I always thought it was just like, oh, I'm sharing power with my neighbors. But I never understood that it was this kind of cross-hatching type of idea and like the the understanding across sub portions of a grid like that that never appealed never got to me i never you're already that. sharing power with your neighbors right because you're right because you and your right. neighbors if I have are solar and my neighbor needs power it's it's making the little hop right you got it it's making the hop because you and your neighbor are on the same feeder right okay right and now let's get into the economics it's making no! the hop right yeah <laughs> it's making the hop and your neighbor is paying the utility company the same amount of money that it pays for every other kind of power. Yeah. And if you're in a net energy metering regulatory paradigm... <sighs> I am for about another six months, unfortunately, and then I'm not. No, no, no. Was... NEM is good. NEM is good. Net energy metering is when... No, I know they're changing away from it, Ari. Oh. Yeah, oh, that, that well, that's too bad. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, if... You know, you're able to sell it back to the utility for your retail price, which That's is great. Right. Yeah. Yep. But you could totally see a situation where a utility was like, well, if you're selling it back into the grid, I mean, you're going to just take whatever price we give you. That's right. Right. And so a microgrid, what it can do is enable you and your neighbor to buy and sell power with each other outside yeah. of the utility right? right which is a really complex market problem don't say blockchain <laughs> no i'm not i'm not gonna say blockchain don't worry they, i feel like everybody eventually says blockchain no and i'm like come on man use yeah. a goddamn spreadsheet and so i mean to to be fair utilities are nervous about these kinds of paradigms because you already pointed out like they're they're used to situations where they're all knowing not mm -hmm. where there are third parties that are giving them information on a need to know basis. Right. So they're very nervous about that. They're also very nervous about potential safety concerns. Like who That's who, very fair. Yeah. Right. You, know, you don't want just Billy Billy Bob hooking up to his neighbor and being like, Yeah, I'll flip it on once in a while. You know, I mean in in you know, like Billy Bob can't do it now because it's illegal now. Right. Yeah. But and right. and if it ever became legal undoubtedly the utility, you know, ut utopia is gonna have a major role. In enabling Billy Bob to to have, you know, his microgrid hosting a bunch of different distributed energy resources, but yeah, it's the 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 real question is whether or not people are going to be able to to buy and sell power with each other using pieces of the distribution system, but not all of it, and if they're buying and selling power between them without any of it any of the mm. distribution system, then what is what is the economic arrangement there? The other thing that's really interesting also is that, you know, a microgrid that hosts distributed energy resources, and in particular, a microgrid that hosts a battery could be a supply asset for the utility, right? So yeah, in, in, right. in a situation where the utility is thinking about buying power at peak demand, and is buying power from those peaker plants, which mm -hmm. is which are expensive, really expensive. Yeah, that's like dirty. You're kicking out a dirty coal or a, a turbine with a gas, natural gas type of thing. It's rarely coal because coal, I think, takes a long time to fire oh, okay. up. Okay. 
I think it's it's sometimes it's actually oil. Oh, interesting. Okay. Because those oil plants can turn on super fast. Huh. And that's super dirty and really expensive. Yeah. Yeah, the 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 utility might prefer to buy electricity from, you know, Billy Joe, who's got it stored. Billy Bob. Billy, Billy Bob, Bob, whatever his name is. <laughs> yeah, Ari, think of the people, man. <laughs> right. You know, the utility might prefer to, to buy it from Billy Bob. And so they might create a contract with Billy Bob saying like, you know, at 6 p.m. in the summertime, mm. when everybody's air conditioning is ru- is running, Billy Bob, thou your your battery must be at least at fifty percent capacity, and we're allowed oh. to take as much of it as you as we want. Oh, and in exchange for that, you know, you're paid this sort of like monthly premium plus like this negotiated rate for yeah. uh, the power purchase. So yeah. you know, there, I did there's... I did have that thought when so like you know I was going through this exercise and pricing out batteries and stuff like that here, and I was thinking I could I could imagine a future where. It is utilities that are incentivizing people to buy batteries as well, right? So they're not only giving you contracts, but maybe they're giving you incentives to just like because because the load on the grid is going to be so high. Maybe it would be the the grid operators too. But like if 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 enough if a sufficient amount of solar comes onto the grid, like there is nowhere else to put it. It would make sense, you know, that even when they go negative on rates and they're saying we'll pay you to take this power. At some point, it might get negative enough. They're like, we'll pay you to put in capacity to take this power. That's exactly. Saying. Exactly. Yeah. And, and and I don't know what that'll look like. I doubt mm-hmm. it'll end up being the utopia that does that, mm-hmm. the utility. I think it's mm-hmm. more likely that it'll be a government entity that ah, subsidizes you buying the battery. Because the battery has a lot of uses beyond yeah. just being a receiver for extra supply. Right. Right. Yeah. Eventually it fills up too. I mean, that's the other problem. Well, there's that. that. And, and also yeah. like in order to keep it's, it's, you know, in order to keep it healthy for a really long time, you need to cycle the battery. Yeah. True. So it can't just like always be empty or always be full. Mm-hmm. Power outages are going to continue to happen. You know, we're, we're working at the department to uh, improve grid resiliency through a number of different programs being run by the grid deployment office, which is really exciting. Uh, we can go into all of the different yeah. provisions sometime. Power outages are going to continue to happen uh, as climate change manifests in our weather patterns. Uh, we're going to have more and more occasions where there are, you know, freak events and and your power's out. Having a battery in those moments is nice. Or mm-hmm. having a community center where there's a battery is really nice because, you know, if you're elderly, you might need a place to keep cool or to keep your medication cool. If you're a nursing mother, you might need to to keep your milk cool somewhere. If it's in the middle of of the summer and it's a heat island, the whole community might need to to keep cool somewhere. Mm -hmm. You might need a kitchen so that you can prepare food for the community. Who knows how long this power outage is going to last for. Uh, You certainly need somewhere to charge your cell phones. Yep. So, you know, yeah. uh, my, My hope is that Every neighborhood in America has some sort of battery capacity at some point so that, you know, residents can take advantage of those kinds of services in the event of an outage. So there's a lot of reasons to deploy batteries, but definitely, you know, managing the duck curve, uh, which is, you know, the the fact that all of the solar comes on supply way earlier than uh, when peak demand is. Yeah. And so you need, you know, long duration, you need like six hours, basically, of you know, battery capacity to to hold all of that electricity before you spill it back out onto the load six hours later. So there, there's a lot of reasons to have a battery is basically the point. If you are, again, if you have that battery on a microgrid rather than just at a single, you know, a single customer or a single meter. Right, 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 right. Like a utility owned versus a person owned sort of thing. Right, exactly. So if you have the battery on a microgrid, then, you know, a lot of people can can enjoy its use. Also, there are plenty of examples of utilities that are putting in bike, uh, batteries into substations. Oh, interesting. Uh, how long do those normally last? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. I just feel like it's always this amount of capacity. That's what I, my mind always comes back to. It's just like, batteries are great, but how long are they really going to last? You mean how many years? No, 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 sorry. Like in an outage scenario, like, uh, is it like a... 
this thing can last for 20 minutes or like this thing can last for four hours or like four days, you know, like four days seems unrealistic, but just like the scale feels like it's never sufficient. I mean, for... it depends on, it depends how much, it depends the rate at which you're drawing from it. Right. And so one yeah. of the things that's really important about doing energy efficiency measures and, you know, there's all kinds of really exciting ways to do that, to, you know, look up net zero, look up passive house, you know, there, there, you could, in theory, build a home that has really, really comfortable climate and can be served by a small battery for three or four days if the home is just built correctly. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so it is like this thing that's like everything's going to have to continue to increase over time to to serve that kind of lower energy footprint. But in the meantime, I don't know. <laughs> right. And And... You know, and we already talked about how difficult it is to come into someone's home and start ripping out walls and putting in yeah, exactly. new insulation. It's really important, though, that a lot of these principles get adopted into building codes. Yeah, right. So right. every state and locality has, you know, a, a, an electric segment to their to their code and an energy aspect to their building code. The Inflation Reduction Act included a billion dollars for building energy codes work only a billion Ari. come on <laughs> i mean it's it's you know what's <laughs> what's funny about it is that we already know what the codes need to be yeah. in order to meet the climate challenge the billion dollars is to try and set up the capacity on the state and yeah. local level to understand and adopt them that's like people basically it's just like salaries almost like bureaucrats uh, yeah and a lot of a lot of consultants I would oh, paper. Imagine. You need a lot of paper. You need a lot of paper when you do stuff like <laughs> yeah. that. But codes, codes are really, you know, codes are a really, really important way to respond yeah. to climate change. So I don't know if you've yeah. ever been to Florida, but <laughs> in, in Florida, yes, you know, building codes, building codes are unbelievably good at protecting communities from the impacts of hurricanes. Right. Yeah. Um, right. 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 You right. know, a lot of people, their homes are on the second level and they're built on stilts. Yeah, there's this piece recently about how they're like moving a lot of the homes that are starting to see a lot of the encroachment from like the ocean. They're like moving homes up now. And like, that's the only option because yeah. they thought, but the homes were built before these codes were in place, basically. Oh, yeah, Is totally. It? Yeah. And so the, and, and so that's kind of the same problem, right? Like it's, you know, how much of a pain in the butt is it to move a home that already exists one story up on new stilts versus just building a new house? Yeah, right. that's right. So it's the same. It's the same problem in energy efficiency. How much of a pain in the butt is it to turn this old house into uh, a net zero energy building versus just building it right in the first place? Yeah, that's a good point. So you know the the codes the codes are gonna they're gonna do a lot to enable Americans to shelter in place with a small battery and still have the power needs that they have met while still enjoying comfortable climates because the houses are built correctly. Mm, Whereas yeah. like if you look at Texas, whenever Texas has like a freak winter event, which I guess happens more and more frequently lately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Past two years, I think, right? Two, three years. Their homes are not built at all to be, you know, uh, energy efficient during heating. They might be energy efficient during cooling but that's a different you know that's a different standard cuz heat rises and and so when you're when you're heating a home you need different things insulated than when you're cooling a home in order to be energy efficient uh none of those buildings in Texas are are built that way and so as a result when there's power outage and most most buildings in Texas have electric heat when there's power outage you know they they lose they lose their heat really really quickly whereas mm, if you if yeah. you built the house to conserve heat you could go days without needing to turn a heating element on in 30, 40 degree weather. And, you know, it's, it's going to be really, really critical that, that there are places in Texas that can manage a community's power needs for three or four days uh, in the event of an intense winter storm. You know, that, that community needs to do a lot in order to get ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's some, some crazy stuff coming for sure. Yeah, it's nuts. I am curious. Uh, you know, we're already at the hour mark, but I, you know, oh my gosh, see, I <laughs> told you at the beginning of the, beginning of the show. Yeah. So you mentioned this hundred billion, uh, and that so your your department's doing two fifty and five hundred for uh, community stuff and state level stuff. 
Yep. What is some of that other hundred billion that might be in there? I mean, I, I know it's outside of what you're normally doing. Yeah, but... no, no, no. So the state and community energy programs where I work is sixteen billion. Whoa. Okay, more than I thought. Yeah. 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 A lot of that, most of that, is actually for the rebates programs for whole home rebate and for electrification rebate, and those rebate programs mm-hmm. are only available to low income residents. Mm. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So that's nine billion dollars right there. Uh, outside of that, there's. I think $23 billion in the Office of Community Energy or Office of Clean Energy Demonstration. And they're just doing an enormous number of projects to, to roll out clean energy across the country. The Grid Deployment Office, which I already mentioned, I'm not sure how many billion they get, but they're running huge programs like the Transmission Siting and Economic Development Program, which is a really exciting program to basically make it easier for transmission siting operators to build new transmission across communities that might historically, you know, that might, might not really be interested in having new transmission lines go through their Tran- transmission siting. You said like, yeah. like uh, buy, buying the footprint basically to, to get new transmission. Yeah, exactly. So, oh, you okay. know, I mean, we talked about all of the new electricity that America's going to need yeah, because right. of EVs and heat pumps yeah. and other things, right? Uh, we're going to need to build a lot more transmission. So transmission is what connects the distribution companies to the power plants. And because uh, a lot more of our power is going to be distributed, because that's just how clean energy works better, you know, because solar takes up a a big footprint, right? If you're going to produce as much energy with solar as you do from a nuclear plant, like you're, you're going to need a whole lot of land. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) that's true. So, you know, that, that means that you're going to need transmission to connect all these things you're also we're doing a lot in offshore wind right you know yeah. transmission siting from the ocean to shore is extremely difficult because you have uh, a lot of interested parties from fishing to tourism to uh, shipping uh, to port authorities uh, a lot of stakeholders care a lot about where those transmission lines go mm. so yeah so that that big bucket of money uh, T said the transmission siting economic development bottom money is basically to to try and grease this the wheels to to make some of those transmission siting decisions a little bit easier. Hmm. There's just tons and tons of programs like that. I think I only got through forty billion dollars or so just yeah. now. Yeah. There's a lot of programs for the loan programs office, which basically does financing and loan guarantees. Uh, for like huge manufacturing programs. There's all kinds of grants and subsidies for manufacturers that want to either build the the necessary equipment so that the electric supply chain can keep running or wants to convert a manufacturing uh, center into uh, one that's more energy efficient. Mm-hmm. There's tons of new money for hydrogen. So there's the whole hydrogen hub competition Hydrogen is a really exciting opportunity that's coming out of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, and and not without controversy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so the, so gosh, I don't know if I if I came close to to talking about the full hundred billion, but that's okay. I mean, like, no, it's it's interesting. I mean, like, it is a lot of different things in there. Yeah, I'm also curious. I mean, you mentioned that you know you'd been doing solar stuff in the past. I wanted to touch on that before we we cut this off too, just because you've done a lot with solar. Yeah. So yeah, I've actually only been at the Department of Energy for two months <laughs> because everything is sort of in startup mode since since all of this new money is has passed. They're just trying to bring on people as quickly as possible and we're, you know, building the plane while flying it. But before that I worked for the District of Columbia Department of Energy and Environment, where I was the associate director for policy and compliance. In that job, I oversaw Solar for All, which is the nation's largest community solar program. And so we could talk, yeah, we could talk about rooftop solar. We could talk about community solar. If you're excited about solar, there's also a really great EPA program called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund uh, that's going to pour $7 billion into low-income solar nationwide over the next few years. So get ready for that. So yeah, what, what, are, what are some of your questions about solar? Mostly around just kind of deployments, uh, you know, what you've seen working, what you haven't. I mean, like the community stuff's interesting. I remember you and I spoke when I was, when I came to visit about some some of the implementations and stuff like that but but just like large scale deployment i suppose especially in cities you know like what are the actual implications of doing that sort of thing you know like when i think about the density of people in cities that feels like that's the 
one of the biggest challenges is like the just the people per square foot square meter it's like yeah. uh, versus the power needs that that an in, individual has yeah so i think like i think if a city did things well just from rooftop solar and maybe some solar arrays like on reservoirs or in areas that you know where they don't want development like brownfields etc you know that's ground mount like so in the district of columbia there's mm-hmm. a brownfield all the way at the bottom of the district called oxen run which has a two and a half uh, megawatt facility but if a city does things well and focuses on rooftop and doesn't focus on you know devoting too much land or too much usable land to solar it could probably meet about 10 percent of the city's load requirement hmm. just with solar being developed inside the city but 10 percent's like not a lot right so where's right. the solar going to happen uh, a lot of solar is going to happen at the transmission level right so we're talking about you know gigawatt size solar arrays just enormous solar arrays uh all around the country you know in particular you know the southwest where there's a lot of land and a lot of sun you're just going to have massive solar arrays. And so the the difficulty there is going to be setting up the new transmission systems to carry that solar to market. And in a lot of power markets, uh, the interconnection queue for new generation into the grid is, you know, in, in some occasions, years long. So there are several bottlenecks facing solar right now, but probably the biggest bottleneck that's facing solar is is making the you know basically trying to figure out how to shorten the amount of time that it takes to go from concept to electrification on the transmission level because right now between permitting and the interconnection queue it just takes way too long Hmm. yeah i always figured it was construction and just like, like all of that stuff that's there's a lot of logistics in there I mean, in the city, in the in a city, mm. the biggest delay is is the regulatory regime, mm. it, because it's differentiated between different cities, different states, all that stuff as well. Well, I, it depends on the city, obviously. You know, here in DC, it's it's pretty easy to get an authorization to install. It's hard to get an authorization to operate, and oh. the amount of work that you have to do to get the utility company to um you know give its blessing before you turn the solar on is is considerable huh yeah just because what what do they what do they care about do they care about like the the hookup the i don't know i guess i don't know enough about solar that it, like thinking it i guess i think about it as like a pretty simple setup but that's obviously not true it is simple a okay. lot of their concerns, uh, so some of their concerns is about safety and making sure that the thing is installed correctly. Okay. But really what their concerns are is that they're going to be able to shut the thing off uh, in the yeah. event that a feeder has too much supply and not enough load. Because yeah. I, 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 I know nothing about how electricity actually works, but I would imagine... <laughs> That if you try and cram more supply into a grid when load is already met, it's not good. Yeah. So I think... Yeah. And you kind of mentioned this earlier too. It's like these power companies are coming from the context of like controlling everything to now not controlling everything. You got it. That feels like a a big paradigm shift for them, right? Yeah, Yeah. totally. Uh, I mean, just the way we do... The way we talk about power in America is radically different now. Right. That like it used to be that you would have massive power plants. Right. And that you would just the bigger, the better. Right. And you would serve however much load you could with that massive power plant. Now, because, you know, the the emphasis is on distributed energy resources, especially on the the sub distributional level, electric distribution companies have just so many more problems to worry about because now they're, you know, they're accepting electricity into the grid from users. They have to know where all these systems are and they have to know how all these systems are operating also to, you know, to compensate everybody correctly. Sure. They have to be able to, you know, so 
so a lot of utilities insist on really, really intense telemetry systems to make sure mm-hmm. yeah. that they know, right? They, they start hemming and hawing about cybersecurity because I mean, to be fair, like if, uh, you know, on a bright sunny day, somebody hacked into every single solar panel in, in the district and shut it down, like that would, that would be quite the headache for, mm-hmm. uh, for our utility. They'd probably hack into the inverter, not the if anything <laughs> right yes sorry they would hack into the inverter very good exactly although if they did yeah. hack into the panel that would be really impressive that, i don't know i don't even know if you could hack into that a pn junction yeah yeah i don't, I, don't I, I have no idea what you're talking about yeah. but yeah <laughs> no it's oh, yeah i mean it is really interesting to me that like just the kind of every the, everything else around this right like solar panel i have solar panels in a bucket in my lab they they work just like every other solar panel that's out there right or you know, there's different efficiencies, there's different outputs, there's different schemes of hooking them all together. But like that is not the hard part. And that's always frustrating to me as someone who designs electronics and like thinks I know something about electricity. It's like the the mechanics of electricity versus the business of electricity. Yeah. And the latter is like so complex, especially when like government and regulatory and safety issues get involved. Totally. And also it's just, I mean, like this yeah. is this is what's really challenging about really, really complicated markets that have intense government manipulation and engagement. And and mm-hmm. like let's let's be clear. It's like thank God the government is regulating the electric market, <laughs> right? Because yeah. like if if your vendor for anything is a monopoly and it's something that you need as badly as electricity, like you would really hope that there's mm-hmm. someone in the room being like, please don't gouge Chris Gamble, right? That's right, yeah. You know, but it's not the the what I often think about when I look at my electric bill that I get in the mail, right? And I, I work in this business. So it's like, I, I should understand it perfectly. And it's still like a lot of it is jargon and fully totally foreign to me it's like i have no idea what that fee right there is for like Mm. sometime open (laughs) open up open up your electric bill it's like incomprehensible right Mm. and it's not radically dissimilar from a hospital bill right when you have these like really really complex economic systems government is working really really hard to align incentives to give customers or patients the you know the best value possible while the providers are all private companies that, you know, that where their incentive is to reward shareholders, you're going to create a really, really crazy Rube Goldberg machine. Like that's yeah, just right. what ends up happening. Right. And it'll be, it'll be an amazing, you know, next step in American economy. If someone can like figure out how to simplify that. Yeah. <laughs> In the meantime, I will continue building my career around like the inanities and idiosyncrasies yeah, right. of the electric market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, there's uh, there's profit in the margins. <laughs> it's complex. I mean, the thing that really wakes me up in the morning is that like it, it, it's just again just talking about the fact that the richest person in the world pays the same amount for a kilowatt hour of electricity as the poorest person in the world if they if they're both in the same market right and Mm -hmm. and to me that's just like i understand that you know i understand the the complications and and moral hazards of making electricity free and i i wouldn't want to do that but it it sure does feel like a a, you know a basic need comparable to like healthcare, right Mm -hmm. i mean during the pandemic every school went virtual right like if your house doesn't have electricity like there is a fundamental need that your school child has that the government is supposed to ensure that your school child gets that isn't met because we have an electricity paradigm that, you know, doesn't look at electricity as a right. Yeah. And I'm not saying that it should be, but it, it, it's just, it, it's very scary for people on the margins of society how essential their utilities are and how few programs there are to enable them to continue to get it regardless if they can afford it. And, you know, that's, that's what gets me up in the morning is that like, this has to be simpler for those people because, you know, kids got to log on to virtual school. (laughs) Yeah. Right. 
or turn on the light to even find out where the computer is. Right. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Or, you know, dad's got to make heated. breakfast. Yeah. Or, right. Or exactly. Yeah. Mom's got to do the laundry. Or, you right. know, I mean, like, yeah, the, 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 these everyday things, right? Like, you turn on a light in your house and you probably take it for maybe not you, but most people take it. Oh, for I totally do. No, you know, you know what? Like, uh, you listen to the haunted house episode. Like, yeah, it was good. Know, nothing, episode. nothing. Nothing makes you appreciate power more than not having it in your house. And like, oh yeah, yeah, it's uh. So I, I'm still like in the glow of that, but I will, I will slowly get work my way back to like just being like, oh yeah, power is always on, no problem, that's no problem. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and and you know, and and the freak out whenever it goes out, right? Yeah, like oh, the totally. the the neighborhood listserv when the power's out for two hours is <laughs> just oh, hilarious, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, it it it, it feels to me at least. Like it's something that's a little bit more than, you know, being able to buy a t-shirt, right? Like, mm. like if you could afford the t-shirt or not, big deal. But like, if you could afford the electricity or not, that has real consequences. Right. And the indignities that we put people through and getting their electricity turned back on when they haven't been able to pay their bills is maddening. Yep. Well, sorry right, to be glad... sorry to be such a downer. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, I, I'm glad that there's uh, folks like you doing this kind of stuff. I mean, uh, I'm glad you know, like this is a very different perspective. I think, like on, like, like I said, on the logistics and the the bureaucracy and the kind of that, the, everything that happens behind the scenes around getting stuff changed. And like I said at the top of the show, I mean, it's going to be different in the U.S. versus in other uh, the parts of the world. So there's there's an interesting perspective there as well. Where can people find out more about what you've been what you've been working on and uh, what you hope to work on in the future? Yeah, sure. So uh, a few things. One is read legislation. I I, I know it sounds kind of ridiculous. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough start right there. <laughs> I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, but like your Congress is spending a lot of your money. That's true. And yeah. you should be like mildly familiar with what it is they're spending it on. That's kind of your responsibility. And then you can, you know, ask better questions of mm. your elected representatives and maybe even run for office one day yeah. with a lot of knowledge just gained from re doing the reading. This isn't yeah. undergrad, right? right like right, you right. actually <laughs> have to do the reading. Right, right. I do, I do have to say, like, I know the numbers may possibly be different, but like when I hear like big round numbers, like a hundred billion, one billion, 250 million. 500 million i'm like are they just making these numbers up it yeah. sounds like they're just making these numbers up <laughs> i honest like i i i don't i don't know a whole lot about the room where it happens but sometimes yeah. i'm sure they're making the numbers up yeah. <laughs> like, or why don't, you know just like just like say like 101.45 billion and i'd be like oh yeah that's fine right you know like that's an additional 1.45 billion dollars but like it would it would make it seem more legit to me, you know, or take it down by one point four or five billion. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know the answer. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The yeah. the round numbers are funny. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of times budgets are campaign documents, right? So yeah, read the legislation. Another thing you could do is, and the legislation again is the bipartisan infrastructure law. So if you Google text bipartisan infrastructure law, it will it it, it will really only take you a couple hours to read it. And it, it's it's really interesting. The same with the Inflation Reduction Act. Just take you a couple hours to read it. Really interesting, like how your government is choosing to solve the climate crisis and also tackle a whole lot of other things. So that's that's one. You can go to energy.gov, which is our website, uh, which is actually pretty decent. Yeah. But if you Google uh, DOE and SCEP, and SCEP is the office I work in, state and community energy programs. You'll you'll get to our front page and there's a state and local service center. So if you care about local government or you care about state government and you care about those, uh, or if you work in local or state government and you care about those entities uh, having the resources they need to carry out a lot of their responsibilities, both under, uh, you know, all of the funding that's available to them from the federal government, but also just like what their residents and businesses expect from them in the, you know, 2020s, you'll, you'll learn a lot about what's available to state and local governments to, to help them be ready uh, and, and all of the money that's available to them to spend. Cool. 
All right. Well, Ari, Ari, thanks for uh, coming on the show and telling us all about this stuff. Uh, I'm going to keep asking you questions on our text chain, of course. And, uh, you know, <laughs> appreciate you sharing your knowledge with the Amp Hour audience. Yeah, I know. I had a blast. And, um, and sometime, uh, uh, I would actually love to hear from Dave what they're doing in Australia in terms mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, how they're, how they're approaching, uh, the climate crisis and what they're doing to, uh, to change their, uh, energy economy. That, that would, I'm sure no matter what it is, good, bad, or indifferent, he's mad about it. So uh, <laughs> I'll bring it up in the next show. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Chris. A lot of fun. Thanks, Ari. Talk to you soon. Bye.